All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, as we continue on with our series uh, through the Sermon on the Mount, this morning I'm going to be preaching on God's law and its eternal purpose. God's law and its eternal purpose. Now let me just say how thankful I, I am that you're here today, and I'll tell you why. Because today's message is key to understanding really what the Sermon on the Mount is about. So if you don't get this passage, you can misunderstand and misinterpret, as many have, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. All right, so let's go ahead and read our passage for today. Chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never, he says, enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, as we approach your word this morning, we ask for you to be our teacher through the person of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would use my words for your glory. And Lord, we're, we are reminded that man at his best is still just a man. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me to say only that which you would have me to say. I pray for Christ to be seen. I pray for Christ to be heard, not for Blake to be seen or heard. And so, Lord, help me to decrease so that you might increase. For you alone deserve all glory and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to imagine a small town just for a moment. The name of the town is Graceville, all right? Graceville. Now, there's a new, there's a, uh, a young man that just moved to Graceville. Now, he's a new convert. He had just gotten saved. And so he moves to Graceville, and one of the first things that he does is he meets the mayor. He introduces himself to the mayor. The mayor is also a Christian. And when the mayor finds out that John is a new convert, I mean, they just hit it off, and he begins to mentor him, and things are just going well. Well, John decides that he and the mayor are such close friends, and because, after all, John is under grace now and not the law, he starts running speed lights, racing through town. He's, I mean, he's almost had several accidents. People in the community have confronted him about it, and they said, John, what are you doing? There are laws that you are meant to obey. To which John said, I'm no longer under the law, I'm under grace. Now, the reason I share that story with you is because it reflects a theological thought that some people have. And it's called antinomianism. I know it sounds like a big fancy word, but it just means no law. Anti. Nomos, antinomianism. In other words, those who hold to antinomianism believe that the gospel has replaced the law and there's no longer any need whatsoever for the law of God, specifically the moral law of God, which are summarized in the Ten Commandments. Well, see, that's the thought that John had. I'm under grace now. I'm no longer under the law. So I can just drive. I can run red lights. I don't have to stop at a stop sign. But what John fails to realize is that the law is given in order to protect the community. And so I say to you this morning, beloved, even though we cannot be saved by keeping the law, we are saved by grace through faith in order to keep the law. 
and we are to keep and obey the law of God. Why? Not as a means of earning salvation, but as a means of walking in humility in the glory of the Lord. It's safety mechanisms for you. It's safety mechanisms for our society. And it's also the way in which the church as a whole brings glory and honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So hear me before I go any further. We are not saved by keeping the law. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone in order to keep the law. All right? So now that we have that understanding, that's exactly what they're accusing Jesus of in this passage. They're accusing Jesus of abolishing the law, replacing the law, and saying that the law has no benefit. Now, of course, that's not what Jesus was saying. But that's the conclusion that the religious leaders of the day came to. Oh, Jesus is preaching salvation by grace through faith. And so in their minds... Christ is undermining the law. But what Jesus is actually doing is he's putting the law in its proper place. And he's teaching the religious leaders and others who listen what the true interpretation of the law actually is. Now, I want to show you something because it's absolutely brilliant in this passage. I told you that we are saved by grace through faith, not by the law. But we are saved by grace through faith in order to keep the moral law of God, which are summarized in the Ten Commandments. So let me show you that. Back up to the Beatitudes. I can't preach this very long because it's not my sermon, but I want to show it to you. When you look at the Beatitudes, which are comprised in verses 2 through uh, 12, right? You have the Beatitudes. And as I was preaching through that, I, if you'll remember what I said to you, that the Beatitudes are evidence of God's grace in our life. These are, not, these are not characterizations or attributes that are naturally in us. They're produced in us through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. So when I come to Christ by grace through faith, at the moment of my salvation, I am indwelt by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God begins to bear these qualities in me. What? Poor in spirit. Mourning over sin, meekness towards others, hung, uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, um, merciful, being a peacemaker, being pure in heart, and even persecution. So Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount by saying, if you are a part of my kingdom, you first have to have inward transformation. First and foremost... You must have inward transformation. And that is what the Beatitudes are teaching us, beloved. They are teaching us before, outward, before there is outward devotion, there first must be inner transformation. What were the religious leaders of Jesus' day doing? They were putting outward devotion without any inward transformation. They believed if they would outwardly conform to the law, then that in itself would transform them spiritually. But they failed to realize that the law could never transform them. Only salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone could transform them. And that's what Jesus is teaching in the Beatitudes. And we know that's what he's teaching. Why? Because how did the religious leaders respond? They said, well, you're just abolishing the law then. And then Jesus says, no, 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 I have not come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill the law. But here's what you don't understand is that inward transformation precedes outward conformity. Now, what, you knowing this is important for this reason. Because the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus going to do? He is going to expound upon the, upon the moral law of God. He is going to expound upon the Ten Commandments. And you need to understand that we don't obey the Sermon on the Mount to be saved. If you could obey the Sermon on the Mount and be saved, then Jesus would never have needed to die. So Jesus is not saying, live like this if you want to be in my kingdom. 
In other words, he's not saying, if you want to be in my kingdom, you better not lust. If you want to be in my kingdom, you better not get a divorce. If you want to be in my kingdom, you better not take an oath. If you want to be in my kingdom, you better not retaliate. If you want to be in my kingdom, you better love your enemies. And all of us would say, we're damned to hell. Aren't you happy that's not what Jesus is saying? <laughs> I am. Whew. Jesus is saying, listen, you're saved by grace through faith. And you're saved, and I have saved you and empowered you to obey the law. Okay? Here's how I want you to live. But Lord, what if I fail? You're saved by grace through faith, not keeping the law. But Lord, what if I commit this sin? You know, pa you know Pastor, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, and, I, and I've been divorced. Does that mean that I'm going to hell? No, you're not saved by keeping the law. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Come on now. And so never forget that. Jesus is providing us a, the, a, a, a guideline, if you will, commands. That's better. Commands on how he wants us to live as Christians. Okay? So let's dive into the message this morning. The first thing that I want you to see is that Jesus, Jesus upholds, upholds the enduring authority of Scripture. Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And so Jesus is upholding, upholding the Old Testament, okay? Jesus, and you see this in verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus clarifies a potential misunderstanding among the people. Instead of denying the Old Testament law, Jesus says, I complete the purpose of the Old Testament law. You're accusing me of abolishing that, but what I'm really doing is fulfilling it. And so Jesus upholds the enduring authority of Scripture. Uh, it wasn't maybe a year ago or two years ago that Andy Stanley said that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Uh, Wrong? Wrong? Majorly wrong. Matter of fact, we are saved by grace through faith in order to obey the law of God, the Ten Commandments specifically. So we see that Jesus upholds the law, and then he's going to tell us the purpose of the law. And you see this in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Here's the purpose of the law, Paul tells us. Therefore, no one will be declared, oh, we have these on the first screen, thank you. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous. Where's the rest of the, is that the, the okay, maybe I've got a different, okay. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, all right? So uh, clearly Paul teaches that no one will be declared righteous by what? By the works of the law. Paul says that clearly. You are not going to be made righteous by the works of the law. Now you may hear this sermon and you, you may say, Pastor, I know that. I know that. I, but I cannot tell you how many people who say they know that and then you go knock on their door to visit them and you ask them, if you were to die today and stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? You know what the, nine, the, the, the most average answer is? I was a good person. I was a good person. So you, you think that you can be right with God by being a good person. You think that you can be right with God by obeying his law. You've missed it. As a matter of fact, that's not even the purpose of the law. Paul said in Galatians 2.16, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. You're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. I got a feeling that the scripture verses I used on my notes might be different than the ones you're putting on the screen. Okay. Okay, all right. That one was the same. I think we're using two different translations, though. So here's you a quote from uh, Charles Simeon. Charles Simeon said this. He says, the moral law proclaims, and this is what the moral law says, 
do this and live, right? That's what the Ten, Ten Commandments. If you want to live, you better do this. But it was never the intent of the moral law to put men upon working out their salvation by their obedience to its commands. That was never the intent of the law. The law could never give life to a man since the fall. Why? Because we've all sinned and we've fallen short. What have we fallen short of? The glory of God, which is manifested clearly in what? The law. Christ is the embodiment of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, we see the beauty and the glory and the majesty of God. And we could not fulfill it since the fall because we're all sinful. So Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, he came and died in our place. He obeyed the law. Uh, Simeon goes on to say this. It could only show him his duty and thunders out its curses against him for his manifold transgression. It required perfect and perpetual obedience, if not doomed to everlasting destruction. If you break one of God's law, then he says you've broken them all. So, how are we then saved? We are saved by grace through faith. But let, before we do that, Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law's requirements on our behalf. Specifically, the moral law of God. And that is exactly what this passage is teaching us. When Jesus says, I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus is saying, I have met all the requirements. I am, what? The perfect sacrifice. I am the one who has given God perpetual obedience. I fulfilled the law because you could not. And the purpose of the law is to show you that, to show you your sin, to show you your rebellion, to show you the righteous and holy character of God and how we are unable to meet those standards. So the purpose of the law is meant to drive us to grace, to drive us to grace. I, had a, I started a, a walking about, you know, for those of you who are guests here, I had a couple of major surgeries a year ago, so... But I started walking, trying to get back in shape. And so I've been walking for about six months. And then I decided, okay, I feel good. I'm going to start rucking. Now, if you don't know what rucking is, it's you put this backpack on your back and it has a 30-pound weight in it, right? And so you walk with 30 pounds on your back. And so I was out rucking yesterday. And I said, you know what? I'm going to ruck three miles. And uh, I decided that I could see a couple in front of me. They were holding hands, so they weren't walking as fast as I was, but I could see them ahead of me, and they were probably about a half a mile. You say, Pastor, can you see that far? Yeah, we live in Oklahoma. Everything's flat. And secondly, <laughs> and secondly, I got lens replacement back in the first part of the year, so I've got eyes like a bald eagle. So <laughs> now those of you who know me, you know two things about me. If you put something in front of me, I'm going to try to catch it and pass it. It's just my nature. I'm sorry. I am one of the most aggressive individuals you'll ever meet in your life. I own it. I understand that. I go all out, full effort upon everything I do, whether I'm coloring a sheet of paper, whether I'm eating a hamburger, or whether I preach a sermon. We're going all out. <laughs> and so when I saw that couple in front of me, I said, I'm going to catch them. <laughs> and not only am I going to catch them, I'm going to pass them. So I took off. I had that weight on my back, and I made the first mile in 15 minutes. So I was catching them. I was getting closer. I could tell I was getting closer. I, my, my second mile was 10 seconds faster than my first mile. And so I was catching them. I was getting closer. I was getting closer. But by this time, my heart rate was at a 150, which is not bad. You can carry on a conversation with a 150 heart rate. You just don't want to get it above that, right? So my heart rate was about 150. I had sweat. I decided to do it before the OU game. I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was hot, like 100 degrees. And I'm sweating profusely. And would you know it, I'm, I'm at almost the three-mile mark, and I can see that couple. I, they're about from here to that door where Keith's sitting right there. That's how close I got to them. And then they stopped and got in their car.
And I thought, I didn't catch them, and I didn't pass them. I gave everything I had, and the Lord reminded me, and he said, you know what? That's the way it is with the law. It doesn't matter how hard you try, how much effort you put in, you're going to fall short every single time. And that's why we need the gospel. And that's why we are so thankful, amen, that Jesus Christ met the requirements of the law because we could not. No matter how hard we try, we fall short. But Jesus completed it. And what does the author of Hebrews tell us? Fix your eyes on him. Why? Because he is the fulfillment. Fix your eyes on him. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. So because Christ has fulfilled the requirements of the law, salvation for us is by grace through faith. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, now that we understand that, then what is the fruit of salvation? If I'm saved by grace through faith, then what fruit will I bear? Obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the commands of God. Specifically, the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. So while we are saved by grace through faith and not by works of the law, we are called as believers to obey God's moral law. This is the response that we are to give God in gratitude for our salvation. And not only that, it is the evidence of the Spirit's work in us. So obedience does not come from a place of earning salvation. Obedience comes from a place of gratitude for salvation. Uh, James said this in James chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Paul wrote, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, what? To do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in. And then Paul went on to say, let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I want you to remember that. Because I'm going to, if, if, listen, if you don't follow this sermon all the way through, I've saved the best part until the end. <laughs> but you can't understand the end if you don't follow it all the way to the end, right? I do that kind of stuff to teach you a lesson. <laughs> that way you say, well, I didn't get anything out of that sermon. You know why you didn't get anything out of it? Because you weren't listening. So, Jesus says, love Paul says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I want you to imagine a garden for a moment. In the middle of this garden, there is a beautiful fountain. Beautiful fountain. We've all seen those, right? But all of a sudden, the gardener notices that his flowers are becoming brown. They're coming brown. And so, even though the water's flowing... Not as powerful as it should, but yet it's flowing. He's concerned about the flowers turning brown. So he starts working on those flowers. He starts moving flowers around. He starts adding dirt and all these things. And guess what? Nothing helps. He puts down fertilizer. Nothing helps. Finally, a neighbor came by one day and he says, Have you thought about checking the fountain? It could be clogged. Because if you get up close, the water looks kind of murky. Well, the gardener was a little bit reluctant, but he decided to do that. So he shut it down, and he took the pump out, and he cleaned the pump out, and he put the pump back in. And all of a sudden, beautiful, clear, pure water started pumping out of the fountain. And it wasn't long before the flowers started blooming again, and everything that was brown started turning green. You see, here's the point. Many of us are like the gardener. We try to fix everything on the outside. And we don't realize that the problem's on the inside. The problem's on the inside. 
And so before we can ever attempt to obey God's law, we first must be transformed inwardly by the gospel. And when we are, the fruits of that is outward obedience. So let me give you an application. See Christ as the lens through which we understand the law and the prophets. In other words, when you read the Old Testament, read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. Read it through the lens of Christ. Because everything that's taught in the Old Testament is pointing towards Christ. It's embodied in Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of. So when you read the law, see Christ. When you read the prophets, see Christ. When you read the Bible, see Christ. And see all that he's done for you and how much he loves you. Because love is the motivation for our obedience. Secondly, Jesus not only upholds the authority of Scripture, the second thing that he does, Jesus warns against relaxing any of his commands. Look at what he says. If you go back to Matthew 5, look at what he says. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, look here, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and not a dot will pass away from the law. The dot is almost like a hyphen in our English language. It's a, it's a hook. It's just a little small hook that, appear, that appears above, uh, above a Hebrew word in order to designate its meaning. It's just a mark, like a little hook. And Jesus says, not one word and not even the smallest hook will be abolished from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So clearly Jesus warns against relaxing any of his commands. As a matter of fact, Every part of Scripture holds significance and authority until its complete fulfillment has been purposed by God. So Jesus says, "Don't the whole Word has authority. All of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, all of it is the authoritative Word of God. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3 when he said, All Scripture is breathed out by God. Jesus upholds that authority. But he also tells us that we're not to relax any of the commands because it is the Word of God. So we see the importance of obedience here in this passage. Not as a means of salvation, but definitely as a means of sanctification. So we see the importance of obedience. Listen to this verse, John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them. Do we have these? Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me and will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. Do you see that? Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me and loves the Father. In Matthew, Jesus said about building upon the rock. In Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on on the sand and the rain came down the streams rode and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and with and great was the fall so jesus says listen if you're either going to be a foolish man or a wise man and if you obey me and my commands you are like the wise man who built his house upon the rock jesus is saying listen obeying my commands will not save you But obeying my commands will give you strength and stability and life. It's almost like John who was running all over town. He thought because he was under grace, there was no need to obey the law. And what he failed to realize, he was putting his own life at risk and everybody else's. Now Jesus told us the summary of the law 
in Matthew 22. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus, or God summarizes the, the moral law with the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments with loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's how the Ten Commandments are broken down as well. The first five, dealing with your vertical relationship with God, have no other God before him, do not worship idols, keep the Sabbath, right? All those things. That's about your relationship with God. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the first of the five. And then the second is like it, the last of the five, not coveting, not committing adultery, not murdering. What is that? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, if you'll love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill the law. Again, not as a means of salvation, but definitely as a means of sanctification. And by the way, we're commanded to love. In Romans 13, we read these words, let no debt remain outstanding. Let no debt remain outstanding, except what? Love one another. For whoever loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And what other commands there may be are all summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor and yourself. So Jesus is emphasizing is clear, or his, his emphasis is clear. Living out the commandments genuinely and from the heart demonstrates true righteousness for God. Uh, True righteousness and love for God and love for others. Now, what happens in a church when you have Christians who say, well, I'm saved by grace. I'm no longer under the law. I have no reason to obey the law. There's no significance for the law. Now, I, don't, I can't remember which team it was, but I was watching a game yesterday. And they came up to the coach, and they were losing, and they interviewed the coach on the sideline, and they said, well, what's going on? And the coach said, if they would just run the plays and fulfill and, and be faithful to their assignments, we would win. If they would just run the plays and be faithful to their assignments. Now, what if you, you've practiced all week? Or even, let's use a, you can use an orchestra, if you will. You've practiced all week. The maestro has given you the sheet music. This is your sheet music. This is how you're to play. These are the notes you're to play. This is when you're to play it. Here's your sheet mu music. And what if you decide, yeah, but I don't feel like I'm being like, you know, uh, I feel like I could maybe make a few corrections. And it would amplify, you know, my playing? Or what if a lineman said, you know, I know this is the play, but I'm going to make a few micro corrections. And because he makes those corrections, the guy next to him makes the same corrections. And the next thing you know, the whole play is blown up. Why? Because no one was willing to follow the rules. And let's say that maestro, he has been working with those musicians, and that one little violinist, she decides she's going to switch things up a little bit. Well, another one hears about it, and he says, you know what, if she's switching hers up a little bit, Keith, I think I'll switch mine up a little bit. And then it came the day for the symphony, and he started the maestro Ketom, and all of a sudden it sounded horrible. <laughs> it wasn't what he had written. It wasn't. Why? Why had it failed? Why, why, why? Because somebody decided that they had the authority to tweak the play. Somebody thought they had the authority to tweak their music sheet. And it affected the whole. What I'm saying to you is this. We are to live under the authority of God's word and we are not to relax any of his commands. That is what he has given us. We have no right to tweak or to twist or to, or to modify. 
We're to look at it, and we're, we are to say, thus says the Lord, and we're to live in obedience to it. Which brings me to my second application. Live or strive to live in obedience to God's word, acknowledging its unwavering authority and relevance, or relevance for all of life. Here's my last point. In this passage, he upholds the authority of Scripture. He warns us against relaxing any of the commands. And then lastly, he says, he calls for a righteousness that surpasses legalism. We all know what legalism, right? Legalism is the opposite of antinomianism. Antinomianism says there's no law, you can live however you want. Legalism says if you don't obey the law, you're going to be condemned. Both of those are heretical. Antinomianism and legalism are both extre opposite extremes that must be shunned. And they should not be embraced because they are not biblical. So Jesus calls for a righteousness that surpasses legalism. Look at what he says. Go back there to Matthew 5. He says in verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, Jesus is highlighting the need for inner transformation and genuine righteousness that goes beyond mere outward compliance to, to rules. And that's what the Jews were saying. The Jews were saying, if we just outwardly comply to the law, then we'll be righteous. And they knew they couldn't outwardly conform to the law, so they added their own laws to it. They began to modify it and twist it. And so in their minds, through their modified law and their outward compliance, they are now right with God. So no one, no one was considered more righteous than the Pharisees. And Jesus is looking at his audience and he's saying, if you want to be right with me, then your righteousness needs to exceed their righteousness. What would you think? There's no way. I'm lost. And Jesus is saying exactly right. Because their righteousness is false legalism. What you need is an imputed righteousness. A righteousness that is given to you by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So, we are not to be hypocrites. Which is what the, the Pharisees were. They would give their tithe but they would neglect justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus said of them, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So Jesus critiques them, condemns them. Why? Because they honor him with their lips, but there's no heart transformation. They wash the cup on the outside, but they leave it dirty on the inside. And what does Jesus say? In the, entering the kingdom of heaven is not about following rules. Do you hear that? Entering the kingdom of heaven is not about following rules, but it is about experiencing and embodying the transformative power that Christ offers through the gospel. Let's go back to our garden just for a moment. This is where I've been leading you to, so I want you to listen. Let's say you, we're back in that garden, right? And as you walk up to that garden, there's two paths in front of you. Two paths. And at the beginning of each, each path, there's a guide. One path is guided by Jesus. Another path is guided by a legalist. Walking through the garden represents your salvation. Oh, there's beautiful flowers, there's a nice path. And so let's say that you come up to the legalist side. You say, well, I'm going to go down this path. And the legalist walks up to you and he says, first and foremost, you need to be quiet for the orientation. And so he begins to give you an orientation. And then after the orientation, he gives you a big, thick rule book. And he says, I need you to make yourself familiar with this rule book before you step onto the path. 
Because in the rule book, it's going to tell you where you can walk and where you can't. It's going to tell you uh, how you should walk. And it's going to tell you the pace that you should walk. And at any point that you begin to break the rules, you're going to be guided off the path. So you got one group that's going down that path, and then you got another group over here, and Jesus the guide says, all right, welcome everyone to my beautiful garden. Enjoy the flowers, enjoy the beauty, enjoy it all. Would you just stay on the path? Enjoy it. Look at it. Love it. Enjoy it. Beautiful. Be mystified with it. But just stay on the path. And if you step off, just get back on. Now, you're at the end of the day. Both groups come together. And the gardener says, all right, tell me about your day. How did your day go? Let's start with the first group. How did you enjoy the garden? We didn't. What do you mean you didn't? Our heads were stuck in the rule book the whole time. We had to walk a certain way. We had to look a certain way. We had to have a certain pace. We couldn't even enjoy. We couldn't even enjoy the garden. Why? Because of all the rules. And that's not Christianity. And then the other group says, oh, we loved it. The flowers were so beautiful. We enjoyed every single moment of it, and the guide was so gracious. That's Christianity. It's about walking and loving and following Jesus and enjoying the beauty of salvation and his creation. That doesn't mean he hasn't given us what? A path to walk, which is what we're going to see in the, Be- the Sermon on the Mount. Here's your path to walk. And you may step off. And when you do, just get back on, okay? And enjoy and enjoy the time. You get off, you get back on. I had somebody ask me, they said, I had somebody ask me, they they said, How can I, how can I be how can I be a Christian when it's just about a bunch of rules to follow? And I was like, oh, you've missed it, right? So let me encourage you. Don't be a legalist. You will never enjoy true Christianity. And don't be an antinomian. Be a Christian who understands that Christ has given us a path to walk. And we are to walk that path in order to bring him glory. Have you noticed this in the passage, and I'm going to let you go. Look at this. Did you notice this? Look at what he says. He says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a rebuke. Don't get me wrong. It is a rebuke. We should be seeking to live as much as we can for the glory of the Lord. But notice what he doesn't say. Whoever relaxes one of these commandments will be cast into everlasting hell. Did he say that? He says, if you relax one of these commands and you teach others to do the same, you'll be called least where? Where? Wow. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be just to get by, right? I want to live for the Lord and cast my crowns at his feet. But even when we relax the commands, as we do, We don't lose our salvation. We may lose reward, but we don't lose our salvation. Let me ask you to bow your heads. Lord, as we come now to this time of invitation, Lord, you have taught us this morning the proper relationship between the law and the gospel. And Lord, I pray for those of us who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ that we would live our lives in conformity to your law. Not out of 
legalism, but out of love. Love for you because of what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray for those here this morning who have been trying to earn their salvation. Maybe they didn't even realize it, but Christianity has been nothing more than a bunch of rule keeping for them. There's no joy in it. There's no pleasure. It's just constant burden of trying to obey God and this person's miserable. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to see the true gospel and see the beauty of Christ this morning. And I pray that they would embrace him as their Lord and Savior and be saved. Lord, I pray for the body of Christ to be edified. And Lord, I pray for you to receive all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and come now as the Lord leads? Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation, uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.